worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ. sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name, you're my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up, when I am dry, you fill my cup, you're my all in all. be seated. I dream of a city called glory, so bright and so fair. When I enter the gate,
Then I said, I want to see Jesus, the one who died for all. I bowed on my knees and cried. city Timothy, I want to see Jesus, cause he's the one who died for me. I clasped my knees and cried holy.
morning offering. Let us pray together. If you've been uh, fortunate enough to be with us on the Sunday evenings lately, uh, Jason Dildine's been speaking about the tabernacle. We've got a homemade example down here. Uh, the significance of the tabernacle is that it was the place where God came to earth to live in the middle of his people. Inside the inner tent of the tabernacle was the Holy of Holies, and in that area was kept the Ark of the Covenant. The lid of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. It was made of pure gold and had an angel on each end that faced each other. And the Bible says they overshadowed the mercy seat with their wings. It was from that specific place between the angels that God, he would speak to the Israel, Israelites. The next song the choir will sing talks about running to the mercy seat. It bridges the gap between the Old Testament priests meeting God at the mercy seat and us New Testament believers that as Hebrew says, are now able to come boldly unto the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace and help in a time of need.
in the darkness where everything is unknown. I face the power of sin on my own. I did not know of a place I could go where I could find a way to heal my wounded soul. He said that I could come into his presence without fear, into the holy place where his mercy hovers near. I'm running to the mercy seat. He said his grace will cover me, it will provide my healing, I'm running to the mercy seat, I'm running to the mercy seat.
we find mercy at that old rugged cross. So if you will stand and let's sing the first, second, and last stanza, and the kids may be dismissed at this time. Well, there's nothing uh, pretty about slaughtering a lamb, is there? You got that right. <laughs> Let me give you a hand with that. Thanks. <clears throat> I think we're going to have to put our shoulder in in this one. Was that stuffing? <laughs> I sure hope it was. How about you, Father? Have you finished with your lamb yet? Yes, it is finished. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. If you would today, let's go ahead and take our Bibles and turn to uh, Psalms uh, chapter 22. And the topic that you studied in the Sunday school class was the sacrifice of the Lamb. And I just kind of want to help us to appreciate what Jesus died uh, or did for us on the cross as our sacrificial Lamb. And then we're going to finish the message with the point of the drama here uh, that it is finished. 
Uh, now, David uh, wrote this psalm centuries before Jesus uh, went to the cross, but he saw uh, it as clearly as the gospel writers witnessed it. Uh, when we stand at the foot of the cross, we witness the very purpose for which God created the world, uh, which is to display his holiness and his love, to display his grace and his mercy and his wisdom. If we understand Calvary, we will understand who God is and we see just how awesome that he is. Then also at the cross we see our own sin, our need for the gospel. At the cross God chose to remove his wrath from those who humbly trust in his son for salvation. Uh, only those who sh um, uh, are shielded from God's wrath through the blood of Jesus Christ can be saved. So let's never forget that we have a costly salvation. It's a free gift, but it's not cheap. There was a sign on a table that displayed some crosses for sale, and it read, Cheap Crosses for Sale. As we will see, there was nothing cheap about the cross of Christ. And so we'll look at the events of Calvary uh, that changed the world forever from Psalm 22. So won't we stand, and I just want to uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll look at this verse uh, at a time. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we just praise your holy and precious name. And Lord, as always, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come out and to worship and to praise you. Lord, we thank you so much for the choir and the songs that's been uh, lifted up to you. And, and Lord, that uh, again, that, uh, that we just pray that Jesus has been uh, uh, magnified and uplifted and, and will continue to worship him in spirit and truth. Now, Lord, I just pray as we look at this message today. I think for Christians, Lord, I just pray that my heart is that, Lord, it just draws closer to you and let us realize uh, that you're suffering there upon the cross. And, and again, just your great love that, uh, that you would, would go there so that we could be forgiven and be given eternal life. Uh, Lord, let us remember just, the, again, the holiness of God and yet his love for us that he sent his son into the world to, to be that sacrificial lamb for us. And then, Lord, as always, if there's those that don't know your personal Savior, uh, may this be the day that your Holy Spirit just to convicts them and gets a hold of their heart. And, and Lord, they would come and repent of their sin. And, and Lord, that uh, become your child. And so, Lord, this is your time. And we just uh, pray that you just use as you see fit. And we'll give you the praise for it all. Amen. Amen. Okay, first just notice here Jesus' prayer from the cross. He's on the cross and, and he cries out to heaven, his heavenly Father. And there's several reasons that Jesus cries out. First, because he was separated from God the Father. Uh, this has never happened in all of eternity. So notice there in verse 1, uh, he simply cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. That word roaring there is often used uh, of roaring of a lion. Maybe the noise of a thunder or cry of an animal in distress. When that dreadful midnight day, midnight darkness swept over Calvary, there was this dreadful cry, a God-abandoned cry. The Lord Jesus was abandoned by his Father, and he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And of course, this wasn't a cry of a lack of faith or trust in Jesus' uh, uh, part. It, it, it's just a cry of disorientation. This has never happened before. Jesus uh, cries out as the enemy closes in and, and the, etern the eternally sinless one bears the sin of all of history. He goes on in verse 2. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime and thou hast not uh, and in the night season and am not silent. You know, Jesus uttered these words uh, during that strange period of darkness which had settled upon the land. For the first three hours of the crucifixion, you know, the sun shone brightly and there was a normal daylight. But at high noon, we're told in the Gospels, a strange and disquieting darkness settled upon the land around Jerusalem. And so the psalmist predicts this uh, happening by saying, Jesus cried out in the day and in the night, in the light and in the dark, but God did not answer. So we have a mystery of God the Father abandoning his son. We have the orphan, Emmanuel's orphan cry here. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And uh, these, um, those passing by uh, thought that he was crying out to Elijah, but he was crying out for God from the depths of his being because he sensed his father's abandonment. Then notice why in verse 3 the father abandoned the son. Uh, he simply says, but thou are holy. And you may be thinking, well, Brian, you know, surely Jesus was the holy himself, the all, only truly holy person who ever lived, lived upon the earth. You know, Jesus said, I always do the things that please the Father. 
God opened uh, up heaven during Jesus' baptism. This is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. So why did Jesus cry out in agony, but thou art holy? Because there upon the cross, uh, he who knew no sin was made sin for us. And that separated Jesus from the holiness of God. He was abandoned by God and Jesus roars out like a lion in pain. He was tasting death for us. Experienced what every lost soul will experience in hell for all of eternity. Jesus bore our hell in order that we might, not, uh, uh, might uh, share his heaven. Uh, this separation uh, tells us just... Uh, how terrible sin really is. You know, in our sin, we're so horrid and filthy and uh, uh, an utter approach to the holiness of God. And yet he loved us so much. Upon the cross, he took upon himself our sin so that we can be forgiven, that we can be made righteous, be given eternal life. Listen, that's the amazing grace of Calvary. He goes on to say from the cross, O thou that in inhabits the praise of Israel, our fathers tr trusted in thee, they trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. You know, God, you have always been faithful. God, you've always been trustworthy in the past. You've never abandoned one of your children, even though many times they were sinful. Yet when they cried out in repentance, you was always there to rescue them. You was always there to save them. You know, God, you, you answered when Moses cried out. You answered Abraham. You answered David. But now the Son of Man is crying out, and there is no answer. The Father's rejecting the faithful, the true, the loving, obedient Son. He was the one who lived totally for God's will to be done, lived totally for God's glory. Oh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, this is just impossible, yet you have forsaken me. So can you kind of sense the injustice here, the, the unbelief in Christ's voice, that this cannot be happening to me? I think as a sidebar to this statement of God's faithfulness to his children um, is that you know, Jesus reaffirms to us that God's God and God cares for us, God loves us. And when, they're, uh, when we're going through a trial, when there's trouble within our life and there's anxiety which we don't even understand, we can say with confidence, God, you are holy and Lord, you've always cared for me in the past. You've never forsaken me. You never leave me. Lord, I will trust you. You know, don't fall into the sin of doubting, uh, but reaffirm who God is and what he has done. Be confident in your times of needs and troubles. You know, Jesus knew the Father forsook him because he could not tolerate the very sin that Jesus was bearing. And Jesus is actually praising God for the proper reaction in holiness. He was forsaken, but he never lost confidence in the character of God. And in second reason Jesus cries out here is because of the scorn. Look at verse 6. Jesus says, But I am a worm and no man, and a reproach of men, and despised of the people. Now that's amazing language for the Son of God. A worm, I'm not a man, less than human. Just a reproach, despised, a worm. Isaiah 52, 14 says, His face was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. Isaiah 53 says, There was no beauty in him that men should desire him. They had beaten him raw, crippled his body. They crushed the crown of thorns upon his head. On top of that, they spit in his face. They slapped him. They plucked out his beard. It left his face a mass of, uh, of bloodiness. It was not a pretty picture. So Jesus was despised. Jesus rejected for you. He's rejected for me. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lips. They, they shake uh, the head saying. Remember Matthew 27, the verse 39, it says that in passing by, the, uh, uh, by they reviled him, wagging their heads. It's like, ha ha, you know, you're just getting what you deserve. And uh, just venomously shooting out their lips and screaming and shouting insults at Jesus. You know, thou that, that, that destroyeth the temple and builds in three days, won't you save yourself? If you're the son of God, won't you come down off that cross? The religious leaders, he saved others himself, he cannot save. Come down from the cross, then we will believe in you. That's exactly what verse 8 says. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. 
Jesus was being treated like a despised and hated criminal as though uh, he had lost his right to be in human society. Oh, think of such love. The eternal Son of God, the creator of every star, becomes for us a worm and not a man. He was scorned. And then the third reason that Jesus cries out here from the cross, not only the separation and the scorn, but how about the solitude? Look at verses 9 and 10. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Jesus is being scorned by man. He's forsaken by God. Yet from the very moment of his birth, he was in fellowship with the Father. He'd always been the delight of God's heart. And, you know, when he began his public ministry, like I said earlier, the heavens opened up and God placed his seal of approval upon him saying, This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Yet now Jesus is all alone. You know, God, this whole thing was your plan. God, this is the reason I came into this earth. I had all uh, my hopes in you, but now I'm sensing this aloneness. And we know, again, it was because Jesus was being made an offering for the sins of the world and all the filth and ugliness, all the defilement and meanness of our sins was laid upon him. That's why Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, 5, uh, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. And with his stripes, we are healed. And so Jesus was abandoned by God when he became sin for us so that, that we could be forgiven and given eternal life. Verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to hell. Of course, Matthew 26 tells us the disciples all forsook him and fled. They ran away. And the prophet says, you smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And so Jesus was alone. The disciples uh, did not come to his aid. They did not come to help. Even though throughout their lifetime, Jesus was always there for them, them again and again. And then fourth here, Jesus cries out from the cross because of the satanic host that surrounds him. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gape upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Now, I believe that is just a satanic host. Some will say that was just the crowd gathered around the cross, but I think it goes much deeper than that. This is the demons from Satan who were having a, a high carnival as they saw Christ hanging there dying. The Canaanites believed that the bulls of Bashan had a, was possessed with the bull spirits and these spirits could uh, possess people. And so this was more than just an angry crowd. This is more than just the battling human beings. Jesus sensed the closing here, the forces of hell itself as they did everything they could to put Jesus out of existence. Christ could perceive these host of demons gaping with their mouth like ravening, roaring lions, the bulls of Bashan. And add to that in verse 16, For dogs have compassed me, and assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Now, Jesus is sensing the, the host of hell, and he, he sees the serpents bruising his heel. That all hell is gathered around the cross. And that's why Paul says in Colossians, When Jesus died upon the cross, he triumphed over the host of demons. Jesus openly displayed his victory over them. Hebrews 2 tells us Jesus destroyed him who had the power of death. While Satan and his demonic host thought it was their great day, the Messiah was bruising the serpent's head and he would crush Satan. And then fifth, notice here, Jesus' cry arose uh, out of, uh, of his suffering. Verse 14, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Listen, that is, that's how crucifixion affects the body. The fluids of the body dry up and they cease to function. The heart begins to flutter before death finally comes. He says, all my bones are out of joint that Jesus was suspended upon the cross by four great wounds, two in his hands and two in his feet. The body would slump itself out of joint and literally suffocate the internal organs. And death would come, but it would come very, very slowly. And remember, after a while, kind of to hurry that process, the soldiers went and smashed the, the legs, the upper legs of the, the two thieves with a mallet to, so that they could not pull up and, and take another breath. It was just a horrible way to die. 
Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a pot's herd. A broken piece of pottery would often just be discarded by the potter, just thrown up on the ground. And, of course, in the Middle East, it was hot and the blazing sun. And that piece of pottery would become splintered and cracked and crinkled and dry. And Jesus says of himself here that here upon the cross, I am broken. I feel wrinkled. I'm splintered. I'm like a dried piece of clay is his suffering. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou, thou hast brought me into the dust of death. At this point, Jesus is utterly exhausted and in his battle up on the cross. And uh, having been there for six hours, his body held up by the nails in his hands and feet. His bones are now pulled out of joint. He's wearied. He's fatigued. His heart feels like it's melted, melted wax within him. His body's dehydrated in the hot sun. Uh, he's just gripped by a terrible, ravaging thirst. And remember, he cries out from the cross, uh, I thirst. And to think of that, church, the one who created every mountain stream, babbling brook, every river, lake, every well, was consumed with thirst. He began his public ministry hungry. He ends it in thirst. And look at the latter part of verse 16. They pierced my hands and my feet. Again, how amazing in this thousands of years before Jesus went to the cross, David had no concept of crucifixion, yet he gives him a picture of what would happen. I may, tell, uh, I may tell all my bones or count off my bones with his head slumping down after a while. Unable to lift that up, all he could see is the bones of his ribs. And, and they look and they stare up at me. It means all these people gazed upon Christ. They took malicious delight in seeing Jesus hanging up on the cross. They feasted their eyes upon him, enjoying his suffering. The priest and the elders described, they gloated to Ananias. You know, he'll never trouble us again. Messiah, yeah, all right. We'll come down from that cross. Then we would believe with you. This is all dripping with contempt and cruelty and callousness of, uh, of all those gathered at the cross that day. But for you and me, Jesus was abandoned by God, abhorred of men. And in 6, Jesus cries out because of the lack of sensitivity. Look at verse 18. They put my garments, they, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Of course, again, the, the soldiers, unbeknown of the scripture here, uh, they fulfilled what, Jesus, uh, what God wrote hundreds of years before the crucifixion. That they took and they gambled for Christ's clothes, a man's outer garment. You no, know, it was precious. And in the Old Testament, it was never okay to take a man's cloak for surety without giving it back before a nightfall. It would be their blanket, it was their bed, it was very important. So when a person died, it normally was given to a family member. But these soldiers here, they were so indifferent to Christ, so indifferent to his suffering mother and beloved John and everything that they gambled for that. The callousness of here uh, to watch somebody hanging up on a cross and bleeding and dying and yet gambling for their coat. Listen, the greatest tragedy in all of eternity was taking place. And, and God's beloved son was suffering physically. He suffered emotionally. He was suffering spiritually. He was dying for their very sins. He was dying for the sins of the world. And yet it meant absolutely nothing to them. Church, how many people live that way today? How many people live day in and day out without acknowledging their creator, without acknowledging God at all, without acknowledging that Jesus Christ died on that cross to save them? I think even more tragic, even as Christians, we many times live our lives as that the cross means nothing. Listen, it means everything to us. Amen. So that indifference must have pained Christ deeply, the lack of sensitivity. And then notice the prayer comes to a climax there, beginning in verse 19. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. All my strength hast thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling. You know, he's the beloved son from the, the powers of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. Now, that's not just the physical suffering here, but the soul suffering. And it's pointing once again to the invisible powers, the satanic forces here. This lion that, that is Satan, that he goes around uh, roaring to see who he may devour. 
You know, Satan and all of his, his demonic host here is present and accounted for at Calvary. The principalities and powers, the rulers of the world's darkness, the wicked spirits in high place, all of hell gathered around the cross to gloat at Jesus Christ, God's beloved Son. There's a mighty battle raging and mighty storm brewing as, as Jesus suffered and died for us. And, and Jesus, notice, says in verse 21, um, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn or the oxen. And that's just a picture of Christ again being impelled upon on two great widespread horns and crying out one final time for God to help him. Now get this, this is a good moth that captures the spiritual agony that Christ is going through when he translates this verse this way as Christ cries out, O oh, thou eternal God. Oh, strength of mine, save my life from these curves. Pluck me from the lion's jaws. Pluck my unhappy soul from the wild oxen horns. You know, Jesus said in Luke 22 that, to Satan that this is the iron and the power of darkness. Listen, Calvary and, uh, uh, and the suffering and the pain that Jesus went through uh, as he became sin for it, it was real. Don't ever think of Calvary just as a little gold cross that perhaps we wear around our neck or a quaint painting uh, in an in a art gallery somewhere. All of, 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 of the God's judgment and wrath of sin broke down on the back of Jesus Christ that day. All of the hatred and rejection of man uh, blasted Jesus in the face. All of hell's fury broke over Jesus' head like a tidal wave. There is not anything pretty about the cross. It was ugly. It was bloody. A curse, a reproach to all men. But yet Jesus Christ loved me. Jesus Christ loved you so much. He was willing to go through all that and die so that we could be forgiven, that we could be given eternal life. It was the longest, it was the darkest, the ugliest day in all of history that day. And you can imagine the, the three days following. It was the loneliest, it was the most hopeless, the most despairing in all of history for Christ's disciples. The day that God died. Christ's last words on the cross was, Father, into thy hands I commit my, my spirit. And, and if anyone can, can save me, Lord, it's you. If anyone can lift me up out of this pit of death, Father, it's you. I trust myself to you. Lord, you are the only one who can deliver me from Satan. And then there's silence. There are pause within this song. As death intervenes and all hope is gone. But then, praise the Lord. The psalm we're going to see begins again in resurrection ground. And that cross will give way to a crown. And the tree will give way to a throne. In verse 21, the psalmist said, You have heard me. You've answered me, Father. God the Father heard God the Son cry. And now he answers him in resurrection power. And so what we have between verses 21 and 22, we can cry up from the grave. He arose with the mighty triumph of his foes. He arose victor from the dark domain. He lived forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Amen. And that brings us to the second part of this psalm. And it's just praise as Jesus praised the heavenly Father. Look, if you would, at verse 22. And Jesus, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation where I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye that the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised, not abhorred the afflictions of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. And all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindred of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none 
uh, can keep alive his own soul. Jesus is risen. He's ascended to uh, ascended so so he gathers around himself. Is what he's talking about. His special people, his brethren. He gathers the church. Jesus today praises God in the midst of the church. The result of the resurrection is the calling out of the people of God. Now we are one with him. We're joint heirs with Christ. We're members of the very family of God. Listen, we're to praise God because he answers the prayer of his son. He raises him from the dead. The resurrection is the ground for our worship. Verse 30. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Or actually that means future generations. It's a reference to people yet unborn. That the psalmist has spoken of Jews and Gentiles, those who are near, those who are far off. That's spoken about the poor and the rich. Now he's thinking of untold generations of people down uh, to the very ends of time. Listen, this is a good point. I believe Jesus could see each of us individually as he died for our sins. He looked 2,000 years uh, into the future, and he saw Brian Kearns accepting his love sacrifice on the cross. And if you know Jesus your Savior, he saw you too. He was thinking of you and me just before he committed his spirit to the Father. Man, that is a wonderful thought. Isn't that wonderful to praise him? That should move us to intense love and devotion to Jesus Christ. That should move us to thanksgiving this Easter season. You, I, were in Jesus' thoughts, we're in his heart. The very moment of his death is for you and me, specifically, that Jesus died. And then notice verse 31. This is so awesome. They shall uh, come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. He hath done this, literally translate, it is finished. It's saying there shall be proclaimed deliverance to the people yet unborn that it is finished. This psalm opens, it closes with the words Christ spoke upon the cross. It began Jesus saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It ends with Jesus crying out in a loud voice just before he dies. It is finished. All is done. There's nothing left to do. Church, isn't that wonderful? And notice this is not a final grasp of saw, uh, a grasping sob of a defeated man. This is a triumphant declaration that the turning point in history has been reached and the work of Christ was, was sent uh, uh, into the world to accomplish. It has been done. I like what Pink, uh, Pink writes. He says, this was not the despairing cry of a helpless martyr. It was not the expression of satisfaction that the termination of his suffering has now been done. It's not the last grasp of the worn out life. No, it's a direct declaration on the part of a divine redeemer that all which he came from heaven to earth to do was done. Uh, it, uh, that's all that was needed to reveal the full character of God has been accomplished. That all that was required by the law before sinners could be uh, saved and has now been performed. That the full price of our redemption has now been paid. That Jesus could die with satisfaction of knowing his purpose for coming to this earth has been, been successfully fulfilled. And these words are the assurance of our own salvation. Our personal sin debt to the Father was paid by Jesus. The difficult work of suffering, of being separated from his Father, treated like a sinner, it was all over. A dying man said on his deathbed, I have lived for myself all my life. And now I have to face God. But listen, the good news is Jesus died without regrets so that he could forgive our regrets. He completed his work so that despite our un uncompleted work, we might enter into his heaven. We should live for God in all uh, our lives. But, uh, but as the dying thief learned, even those with no good work can receive the gift of eternal life. It is finished. That's one word in the Greek. And Spurgeon says of this word, uh, 
the, uh, this one word would need all the other words that were ever spoken or ever can be spoken to explain it. It is altogether immeasurable. It is high. It cannot attain. Uh, uh, I cannot con- attain it. It is deep. I cannot fathom it. Jesus spoke. It is finished with a loud voice. He wanted the whole world to hear. It was the most triumphant cry in all of human history. Jesus successfully completed the great, the mighty work, God's eternal plan. If Jesus had not finished it, we would be damned to hell. But he did what he was set out to do. On the cross, the justice of God was fully satisfied. For Jesus paid the great price for our ransom. He paid the wages for our sin. That's why we sing, Jesus paid it all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that good news today? Put your sin in a ledger and write paid in full next to it. Have you had an abortion? Paid in full. Have you committed some type of fornication or sexual sin? Paid in full. Have you cheated? Paid in full. Have you lived a life of greed? Or have you abandoned your responsibilities in some way? Paid in full. Had some type of criminal behavior, some selfishness? Paid in full. The greatest sin of all, of course, is our failure to follow the command, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, with all thy mind. That's why the Bible can say emphatically that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The way to heaven uh, is narrow. The Bible says the way of destruction is broad. So if you have never accepted Jesus Christ for your personal sin bearer, uh, you need to come to him this morning. Your sins have been paid in full. Folks, the issue is, is not the greatness of our sin, but the, but the worth of the sacrifice that Jesus provided. The greatness of his grace. I was thinking someone like Timothy McVeigh, who was responsible for all those deaths that, uh, at the bombing of the federal building there in Oklahoma. And he was not beyond the forgiveness of God. If he would have come and repented, if he had come to Jesus Christ and asked him forgiveness, he would have been forgiven. God does not want our worth. He wants our willingness. And if you don't accept Jesus, though, you will stand before a holy and righteous God, and he will cast you aside into eternal hell, the Bible says. And that punishment will last forever. You will never be able to say it is finished. Jesus did in six hours on the cross what we cannot do for all of eternity. God's justice on those who reject his son will never be satisfied because only Jesus can satisfy those demands. Again we sing, lifted up was he to die, it is finished was his cry, now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, hallelujah, what a savior. Oh, if you, if you trust Christ, you know it's finished. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whomsoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. All we can do is bow in worship and adoration to our God who planned everything out from the beginning of time. And then he brought it to completion. Uh, we've been made the recipients of, of, uh, of, of God's work of grace through his son Jesus Christ. Uh, how our hearts should explode in love and gratitude. Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? He was forsaken so that you might never be forsaken. He bore your sin so that you might not have to suffer for them. And then as a Christian, once we give our life to Jesus Christ, I pray, and I pray this message will just draw us closer to Jesus Christ as our Savior today, that that we would say, like the psalmist says, the deer panteth for the water, so my soul thirsts after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength and shield. You alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire. I long to worship thee. Be. Folks, that's what the crowd, that's what, that's our response and thanksgiving for what Jesus Christ has done for us, the suffering and all that he went through. And so, so won't we come with the invitation?